Hi, I'm Praveen Swami, National Security Editor at The Print. Welcome to this episode of Softcover. Uh, it's a very special episode because we have with us Mr. A.S. Dullat, who, as many of you know, was former chief of the uh, research and analysis wing, uh, had a stellar career as an intelligence officer in Kashmir, in Punjab, uh, working on jihadist terrorism and a bunch of other things we'll be talking about today. Uh, Mr. Dulit's latest book has attracted a huge amount of attention. Uh, unfortunately, because of the last chapter, I think more than anything else, which has to do with his former colleague, uh, we'll of course come to some of those questions, but I'm hoping to widen the conversation out a little bit and talk about some of the other really uh, fascinating uh, uh, material in this book. And I, I thought I'd start by asking you, uh, sir, you the, the book essentially recounts a career that has gone from crisis to crisis, uh, starting with the Maoist insurgency, moving on through Punjab, uh, various sort of external jihadi threats, Pakistan, Kashmir. Um, so as a first question, has intelligence, which ought to have averted or preempted some of these conflicts, has Indian intelligence in fact been an effective stool, uh, a, a tool of statecraft? Or has it failed to really deliver in its core function, which is preempting and averting uh, threats to the state? No, I think the, the our intelligence services uh, do a pretty pretty good job. They're as good as any anywhere in the world. Given you know, we obviously have our limitations. We're not the ISI. We don't have that kind of autonomy. Or, right. So or, you're, you're not going around leaking tapes of yeah, a certain yeah, person's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we don't have that authority and we don't have that autonomy. Thank God. But uh, but uh, you, you mentioned Kashmir and you mentioned uh, insurgencies and terrorism. Let me tell you that in Kashmir, I'm quite clear in my mind because I followed this story for a long, long time now. It's 35 years. That in my mind, I'm quite clear that what we have been trying to do since day one is to mainstream Kashmir to get Pakistan out of the Kashmiri mind. And I think we have succeeded hugely. Where we are today, with or without 370, uh, you know, I, I think Kashmir is mainstream. The separatist or the, the Hurriyat is, is finished. It doesn't exist anymore. There is a Mirwais who is locked up in his, in his house. And uh, I think he's also ready to be mainstream. But other than that, um, I think it's it's been a hugely successful operation. And uh, you know, we talk about 370 and uh, whatever it is. I thought there was nothing in 370. It was only a fig leaf because 370 actually ended in 75 when Sheikh Saab, Sheikh Saab signed that accord, and he said that accession was irrevocable. So that was the end, and I think I think we've done well. And even uh, when it comes to terrorism, and you know, there was a time when we were having a, a really rough time with both Punjab and Kashmir, and I think we've managed uh, both states pretty well. No. The only difference was that in Punjab we were prepared to, to use the danda, uh, thanks to Mr. K. P. S. Gill, a little more, and the Kashmiri being different, we have dealt with him differently. And we've, ter we've tried uh, throughout to turn them around. And that is why my stress on, on engagement. I was asked the other day that what have you achieved by, by engagement? I said, for one, we brought Majid Dar across. You know? But other than that, I mean, I go back much further back, as far back as 91, we had started talking to almost everybody, all the separatists. And if you remember, in '94, four of the top military commanders uh, surrendered. Surrendered. So it's not that we've done nothing in Kashmir or so we I, achieved nothing in Kashmir. I, I want to come back to Kashmir in just a second, but you you mentioned two of your idols, uh, of course, are in Kau uh, and M K Narayanan. You have a great deal of discussion of their careers. Uh, I I wanted to ask you, M K Narayanan's career, his influence built around combating communism, which in that's the right, 60s, right, 70s, right, seen right, as a great right, threat. That's right. Do you 
feel in retrospect that the intelligence services ended up exaggerating the fear of Maoism or creating a false fear of it because decade after decade after decade after Mr. Narayanan's pioneering work on this, we have ended up confronting one form or the other of Maoist resurgence in one corner of the other of the country. Uh, where we may kill or you know eliminate some of the threats, maybe put down an insurgency, but some of the factors behind that insurgency seem to crop up in various forms unaddressed. You see, there's uh, this uh, this the thing about uh, playing up on on communism uh, was a hangover of uh, of the British Raj, and it took a while for the IB to get over that. I think it was. Uh, during Mrs. Indira Gandhi's time, that she said the IB needs to clear the cobwebs of the mind. You know, the threat mm. the threat is not from communism. The threat is from the right wing, and that was the time, if you recall, that the RSS was banned. Also, right. I'm talking of about 1970-71. So that's when the whole thing changed, and um, Mr. Narayanan, no doubt, was, was the last word on, on communism. And uh, the great B. N. Malik, I think, said somewhere that he was uh, the best intelligence officer in, in Asia. I think something like that. Yes, you've some, mentioned that in your book. Some, it's some, quite... some remark like that. And I've I've seen Mr. Narayanan very closely. You know, I spent my first two years in the bureau sharing a room with the great man. Oh wow! And this you must have been a very young officer yourself. I, I was the junior most uh, joint assistant director and he hmm. was the senior most assistant director waiting to get promoted any day. And I watched him. You know, he, I mean, he was so senior that I could not take liberties with him. But I used to watch him uh, working and I said, wow, this guy is, is someone. You know, he, he is special. He knows how to use intelligence. Because, you know, if I got a report, I would get excited and I would want to do this, that or the other immediately with it. And he would quite often sit on these reports till he could, you know, put them all together and, mm. and make a bigger picture out of it. So he was very good. There's no doubt about uh, Mr. Narayanan's capability. It's another matter that uh, he didn't uh, work too much uh, in the field and he didn't... Uh, do too much of uh, counterintelligence uh, work, but in his own thing, he was very as a spook. He was very good. Let me put it like that. He was one of the finest uh, DIBs that we had, and uh, as you know, uh, Rajiv Gandhi um, couldn't function without. Okay. Him. So, a, a question here. Well, one of the criticisms that's been made of the intelligence bureau over the years was that it basically became like an intelligence gathering or news service for the government of India, looking at everything yeah, from a, food bit, shortages. Is that a fair criticism? That's a, that's a bit unfair. It's not just a, a news shop or whatever it is. Uh, I think a lot more was being done in the Bureau. And, uh, you know, I spent a, a great part of my career doing counter intelligence. And I think that's the, one of the most important areas of our work, really. I get, the, I get the sense just for the benefit of our viewers is stopping other people's spies from being able to spy right, That's right. That's right. And uh, I get the sense now. I, I just. May, I hope I'm wrong. That now with so much else happening in the country, I think maybe, possibly, counterintelligence is being neglected a little bit. That's a real danger if yeah, uh, it is, if it is. another country is able to operate. Yeah, it is a danger. I think we need to. We need to brush up a little bit on that. So, Kashmir, since we're talking about uh, the ability to assess, the ability to preempt, you were in Kashmir, of course, when this long uh, insurgency broke out. Yeah. Do you believe there was a failure to fully appreciate the threat, uh, at least after Farooq Abdullah's government uh, was evicted from office? Uh, the, you know, there's, there's, there's supposed to have been the most flagrantly rigged, rigged election. Uh, in Indian history, undoubtedly a, a angry youth cohort. Did we fail to appreciate how much of an uh, insurgent challenge this could become? Well, let me tell you, you know, I, we've heard so much about the rigging of that 87 election. First of all, I, I, I joined the Bureau in Sirinagar about uh, six months after that election. Hmm. 
So I, I, and uh, I wouldn't know about that. But um, I can tell you when I joined then, not many people talked about the Rugi. Interesting. It came up afterwards, it came up when once this whole thing started, once militancy broke out, hmm. then it was all attributed to, to 87. But I think that's a, that's a huge exaggeration. I would rather go back to 84 or 82. You know, um, Pakistan was never happy with Sheikh Abdullah. You know, if there was one villain, one Kashmiri villain in their mind, it was Sheikh Saab. And uh, they were just waiting for Sheikh to, to go. And uh, once uh, the Sheikh passed away in 82, then they thought now we will, we will get an opportunity possibly to meddle a little more in Kashmir. And then we had Farooq as, uh, as chief minister, I think just for a year and a half and he was dismissed. I think that that dismissal was a blunder because everyone in Kashmir will tell you that of his uh, three tenures as chief minister, that first one, the shortest one, was his best. And um, when he was really looked upon as Sheikh's son, as, uh, as a proper Kashmiri leader, thereafter he, he became, in the Kashmiri way of thinking, a, a stooge of Delhi. You know? because mm -hmm. of the 86 accord and the 87 election and then so on and so forth. But Farooq is still Farooq and I have no doubt he's still the tallest Kashmiri leader. Uh, and uh, I also say that he's the only Muslim leader in the country. Going back to 87, 88, you're watching things on the ground. The jihad is about to begin. Did you expect it to become as big and as violent? An I had event no as idea. Day? I was clueless. I had no idea. You know, when it all started, uh, the bombs, first bombs went off on the 31st of July, 88. And there was a bomb in the Serena Club and there was a bomb in the Central Telegraph office. And uh, we didn't know what was happening. I, I didn't know. The Bureau didn't. The SIV didn't know. And uh, I asked one of our Kashmiri officers, a chap called Sapru, who was from the JNK police. I said, Sapru, what's happening? He says, ah, we ladke aate jaate rehte hain, koi aisi baat nahi hai, it's not a big deal. So, we were really in the dark and if, if we are talking of an intelligence failure, then it, it was an intelligence failure at that time. Four officers killed, killed. you write about this in your book, yeah, in the, and, in the people span turning around, and people turning around to you and saying, we need to get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a what, terrible time. Do you, do you, did, did you ever consider during that patch, that horrible period and the couple of years to follow, uh, that India might end up being defeated? I'm asking this question utterly no, seriously no, because no, no, the no, no, old no, war had no, just, no. you know, the Berlin Wall had collapsed, Romania had happened. Was this ever a fear in your mind? No, not, not really, not really. But don't forget at that point of time, uh, we had very few supporters outside, you know. The, the Americans were yes. referring to the, these boys as, as freedom fighters. And I remember speaking to uh, Robin uh, Raphael many years later. Robin Raphael, for the benefit of uh, uh, younger viewers who may not remember this troubled history, American diplomat considered uh, very pro-Pakistan and uh, a real annoyance to Delhi in some in Yeah, so I caught her once in, uh, in uh, I think it was in a meeting in Istanbul. I said, come, let's have a coffee. And I said, you, you caused us a lot of grief, you know, when you were Assistant Secretary of State. She said, you know, it was not my policy, it was the State Department's policy. So I said, okay, but if you recall, it was her husband who was blown up with, uh, yes. with Zia ul Haq. So that's, uh, these are the... And, and there are many who still believe there was some deeper conspiracy to that assassination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Many questions hanging over it. I'd like to jump a little bit from, you know, the situation of seeing uh, your officers hunted down and killed, chaos. But you were one of the early advocates with people like Shabir Shah for talking to the same people who had been tormenting you. Was that a change of heart or did you believe that they could be brought over? Were you just uh, you know, when I buying saw, time? When, or? when I saw the gun come out in such large numbers and people being shot down, I still recall when uh, Governor Manmohan came, uh, Jagmohan came back uh, as governor and uh, the 
the, the moment or the day that or the morning that he arrived in Srinagar, he called me. And I think it was the 23rd of January, possibly. Because he came as governor on the 21st, he spent a couple of nights in Jammu, where there were celebrations for him. And then he came up to, to Srinagar and he called me. And um, uh, Mr. Marwa, one of his advisors, Ved Marwa yes. was with him. And we had a long chat and uh, Jagmohan said to me at the end, what is the way out of all this? What is the way forward? I said, sir, two ways are to talk about it or put it So, he said, no, no, I'd like to talk. I know all these fellows. I know this Malvi. I know that fellow. I, know this. I said, sir, I have no doubt you know them all, but times have changed. In, in the space of three, four months, uh, a whole lot of this thing has changed in Kashmir. People may not be willing to talk to you. And when I went out of the room, Ved Marwa followed me out and he said, what is this nonsense you're talking about talking? I said, sir, But even then I was convinced, you know, seeing what was happening in Kashmir, that if there was a way out, we needed to talk. But I can tell you, Praveen, to be very honest, uh, you know, I was uh, actually shunted out of uh, Kashmir because uh, Jagmohan told Delhi, this fellow is, is bad news here. He's Farooq's man, he's Farooq's friend, get him out. So I was pulled out. I was, I was very happy, I was relieved because so the situation was so bad. And I was relieved. I said, I'm glad to get rid of this uh, whole Kashmir thing. Coffee will get. Naked. You know, sometimes uh, <laughs> destiny has planned it otherwise for you. So when I come back here, I get a year's respite during which Mr. Narayanan had also been shunted out by thanks to Mufti. And uh, when uh, Mr. Narayanan comes back, when Chandrasekhar became Prime Minister, and he tells me, you've been having a lot of good holiday, come back and do Kashmir again. And then Kashmir never left me. So our senior officers then, we had a special director by the name of uh, Srivastav, Owen Srivastav, and he said to me, Tum to abhi, abhi ho Kashmir se, tum inko jante ho, inse shuru karo. Uh -huh. And then I started traveling all over and meeting all these people. So. In the course of those years, this has broadly, uh, if you like, what, what you did in those years, distilled into this division between what's been come to be known as the Dullat Doctrine and if you like, for want of a better word, the Doval Doctrine, no, talking no. and hammering. <laughs> if I'm just, uh, no, no. Huh. Ajit Doval has a doctrine. I have no doctrine. <laughs> I, I have an open mind. Okay. But I do believe, I do believe, like I've said repeatedly, that the answer to Kashmir is engagement. Right. And you... Uh, there was there was Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee who yeah. felt the same way. Absolutely. Uh, even Mr. Advani held meeting uh, held a, held a face to face meeting with separatists. Yeah. Here's my question though: the criticism that used to be made of uh, engagement and of talking yeah. was that look, we give these race we get these race horses, we give them gourd and chana and give them a nice rub in uh, rum or whatever you rub race horses down mm -hmm. with. And every time when it comes to actually talking business, mm -hmm. these guys skitter out. There was a conversation under Vajpayee, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh did his best. You worked on them for many years. Uh, but at each bend, somehow, either because of threats from the ISI or other circumstances, uh, it ended up not getting anywhere. Was it, in retrospect, a flawed process because the ISI was too powerful? Were these guys not good faith negotiators? What was the problem? No, no, they can't. Uh, obviously, this is a thing uh, that can be argued till kingdom come that it was a flawed process. I don't think it was flawed. I think it was because of the process that we could get uh, the separatists actually to come to Delhi to talk to the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of India. So I think things were just beginning to happen. I think uh, it's, it's a misfortune that a couple of things went wrong. First, of course, the, the failure of the Agra summit. It was, it, was, it was a meeting that both sides wanted should succeed and yet somewhere something went wrong. And uh, because of the failure of the Agra summit, actually um, 
three years got wasted. You know, mm. Mr. Vajpayee could only go to to Islamabad for the Sark summit in in January two thousand four. Oh. And uh, I still remember when they were going, I went to Brijesh Mishra and I said, you've traveled all over the world. And I sit here in the PMO. I've never asked to be taken anywhere, but I'm very keen to see what Pakistan is <laughs> all about. And he said to me, he said, Ab bahut aayenge. that is when I figured that there was a back channel on. You know? Otherwise, Brijesh never gave me a hint of it. But obviously, things were working well at that time. That's fascinating. So you never knew that I all these know. meetings are... No. This remark of his and one before that we were talking and we were, there was a table there. And he said, you know what you're doing is good. And what we are trying to do something parallelly. And we hope at some stage that both these lines will merge. So that is the Pakistan channel and, and the separatist... And the Kashmiri channel. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, that's that's the way it was and I thought we were moving forward. Musak summit uh, went off well. Mm. Uh, Musharraf said what we wanted him to say. and uh, But then, the BJP lost the election. And that we lost time. Because by the time Dr. Manmohan Singh gathered everything and started again, uh, it took time. And uh, I don't know, I, I think Dr. Manpon Singh was the, the most well-intentioned of our Prime Ministers who wanted to move forward with Pakistan but just couldn't. Can you imagine a Prime Minister not being able to visit Pakistan for 10 years? And every time I met the, the great man, ah. the, the wonderful gentleman, he said, I want to go but I can't go. He was so helpless. Because of his own pressures within his, his party. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and so he would always blame the party. But I would say, sir, even your bureaucracy is not with you. So I want to come back a little to the person of Rajesh Mishra here, mm -hmm. with whom, you, you know, as you said, was the critical figure in the PMO. Um, he virtually ran the government. Since then, uh, for the first time, we've had an intelligence officer as uh, the NSA, of course, but no, we've had powerful... No, no, not the first time, Mr. Narayanan. Narayanan, so yeah. the second time. And we've had powerful NSAs since Brajesh, mm -hmm. if, if you like that and institution. All of them have been powerful. powerful. Uh, different types of people. There is a criticism made of the institution of the NSA, that it's cut off the Prime Minister's direct interaction with the intelligence chiefs, with the relationship. Uh, with the you know, cut and flow of, of everyday information that the intelligence chiefs have. Do you think that's a fair uh, criticism? No, it didn't happen during during Prime Minister Vajpayee's time. Nor did Bridges try to uh, at any time sort of cut off anything. In fact, he encouraged us to, to meet. If sometimes when I hadn't met the Prime Minister for a, for a few weeks or something, he would say, and, and what happens if you had a difference of opinion with uh, Rajesh, as you must have done with any professional uh, relationship? No, I think we were on the same page kind of thing. I don't think we had many differences. And in any case, I mean, I didn't take that kind of liberty. Uh, our differences were sorted out in his room rather than in the Prime Minister's room. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but there wouldn't be, you know, there was just one occasion I remember because he used to get the, the Prime Minister's um, timetable for the day on his table. So one day when I went into his room, he said, Aj, uh, PMC Milre or Char Vajetum, is there something special? Means I don't know about it, so I. <laughs> what are you up to? <laughs> no, so I said, sir, it's a usual briefing. He said, ah, take it, karo, karo. No, he, he never discouraged us, nor did he discourage the DIV. I know because Shamal and I were friends and we had worked together. No, he never discouraged us. I don't know what happened subsequently. One of the fascinating... But the fact huh? is that, you know, in our structure, the post of the National Security Advisor is a very tricky one because there is bound to be problems with the Home Minister. Because actually, we have created two... We are creating two home ministers. Right. Yeah. And that doesn't work 
smoothly or easily. You know, there was a, um, uh, between Advani ji and, and Brijesh Mishra, they, they never saw eye to eye. They hardly spoke to each other. In fact, Kandahar, which you describe in the book, was one of the instances where there was a great deal of pushing and shoving. Was there, yeah, was yeah. there not? Pushing or shoving or not, but even at that moment of crisis, both did not come to the crisis management group at the same time. It was as if, you know, only when one had left, the other would arrive. Kind of thing. Which is quite astounding that uh, the national security advisor, the home minister, do you see echoes of that in the current situation? Because it is rumored that the home minister and the national I, security I don't advisor... See, I don't see echoes of that. I don't think it's like that. But I don't think Ajit is having such a such a smooth ride either, you know. It, it's it's a tricky thing. It's not easy. So it depends how sharp, how smart you are, and how you manage it. You see, Brijesh could manage it or he did it his way because he had the full support of the Prime Minister. You know? And that doesn't always happen. Right. Especially... You know, now, now, for instance, uh, uh, Mr. Narayanan and Mr. Chidamram had been good friends. But I don't think that was a perfect relationship either. No, it was widely rumored that there were differences of opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are bound to be. There's a conflict of interest here, you know. Who huh. actually executes and shapes yeah, policy. Yeah, and who's whose man? Is the so, DIB my man or your man? Your man or my man? And this is a problem that Adwariji had with his DIB. Because, because uh, Shamal was reckoned to be much closer to the family. Right. So these are not easy things to, to, to handle. Coming to the specific question of Mr. Dover, he's often characterized as a hawkish figure, hostile in principle to dialogue. But you, in your book, write that you had him on board more or less. Uh, for a track two conversation with many Pakistani spokes. Yeah, yeah, he was there for a couple of rounds and he left at the right time. He knew when to leave. He knew that the new left of the new when to leave for his political progress or for for his own good future. Yeah, he knew. He knew that the two, when the election was coming up that the BJP would come back to power. Possibly he thought uh, Advani might be prime minister and he had a Fabulous uh, rapport with Advani ji. So he thought, uh, now is my opportunity, now is my chance. And uh, when it turned out to be the Modi ji, it was even better. Because this is a combination they are made for each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to that relationship with Advani, uh, one of the interesting things was that if it, Mr. Advani had so desired, mm. Uh, he could have rigged the rules to give Mr. Doval a longer tenure in office or brought him in earlier. Oh, for he sure, didn't. sure. But he chose not to or did he try and we don't know no, about No, that. no, no. But he, he he was not there when the crucial time came because uh, Mr. Doval became DIB in the UPA government. So Advaniji was not there. Advaniji would sure have given him a long term. I have no doubt about it. And deservingly so. On the question of the direction of intelligence today, mm -hmm. uh, under the current dispensation, um, some of these sort of longer, more patient processes like talking to people and so on seem to have shuttered down in favor of what's called uh, kinetic means, which I assume as an amateur uh, means finding people and shooting them or blowing things up and so whatever, on and so whatever, forth, that, whatever it means. I, I, um, we see this not only in Kashmir, of course, but also in Afghanistan, where we've shuttered down, stopped students from you know, coming in such large numbers, uh, don't have quite as much engagement on the visa front. Number of other places, track two is floundering a little bit because there doesn't seem to be much official buy-in. Um, do you believe this is a problem that emanates from the National Security Advisor and the intelligence services or a government that sees no benefit? Uh, from this kind of talking and more patient no, it's, 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 it's got to be the government. It can't emanate just from the agencies or the even the National Security Advisor. They are there to advise, you know. Uh, the DIB would advise uh, the Home Minister or the Prime Minister. The Secretary R would certainly advise the Prime Minister. And uh, But uh, the direction comes from the top, you know, always. 
This was a prime minister, though, who went out of his way to visit Nawaz Sharif, cultivate a personal relationship, goes for a wedding, uh, you know, uh, makes a great deal of so, his personal so, rapport with so, leaders. What, what happened? So there was a time, obviously. You see, those were early times, early years. And uh, let's not forget that even for his swearing in, uh, Modi ji did invite uh, Mia Saab for the swearing in. So there was a feeling at that time that if if uh, a relationship from which India could gain uh, what to take off, then well, we have nothing against it. Let's give it a try. But presumably we still have things, I mean, the, the same argument could be made today. But today the, 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 the attitude has changed considerably, you know. Uh, I haven't heard the Prime Minister talk of uh, any great desire to make friends with Pakistan or to move forward with Pakistan. And uh, nor does uh, Mr. Doval talk about it. And the Home Minister is clearly hostile to Pakistan. In fact, he chose Srinagar to declare that we will not talk to Pakistan. So, I, I mean, it's uh, for the present, I don't see any forward movement with Pakistan. Of course, talks always go on, you know. I'm not suggesting. Right. That it is, there is, it is rumored that there was a yeah, channel yeah, between yeah, the yeah, NSA yeah, and yeah, yeah. General Bajwa in Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, uh, and uh, so on. Unfortunately, Bajwa is not there now. Yeah. Like uh, Musharraf is not there now. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say the same about Musharraf. That, you know. If Musharraf was there, then things would be different. And yet, when Musharraf was there, we said, how can we trust this fellow? He, <laughs> he's the villain of Kargil. So, in a, in a, sort of to bring this onto another topic, I mean, the reason I, I'm, I'm really sort of enjoyed this book as with Mr. Durlat's earlier books, one of the reasons is the book itself. But the other reason is there's almost no writing about Indian intelligence. Uh, by uh, insiders. So I'm, I'm struggling to think after B.N. Malik's book, there's been a couple by people in the Intelligence Bureau, one I can think of by an RAW officer, which is somewhat criticized, but a very, very thin literature. Your colleague, Mr. Vapala Balachandran, B. Balachandran has just written a review of intelligence, but that's not really uh, primarily about Indian intelligence and things that have happened in it. Um, why is there so little literature? So we've had in recent weeks. Yeah, I, I was I was saying this. I've said this uh, quite a few times that I think it's high time that at least uh, the the intelligence bureau had an official history of of the, of the service done because all the agencies all over the world have official. MI5, the CIA. Yeah, 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 yeah. So why should we not have it done? And I can tell you that uh, when Nature was... Uh, this is Mr. Nature Sandhu. Nature uh, Sandhu, yeah. When he was DIV, he was quite keen to do it. And we we had a discussion on it. And he asked me, he said, what do you think? I said, good. It's overdue. You must do it. So Nature had that, that sort of uh, feeling. He, he was a DIV with a lot of panache, you know, and he functioned that way. Have you seen, heard any further conversation in that direction? Uh, I understand R.A.W., for example, has somebody archiving their material now. Yeah. But do you see an official history ever coming out? Bearing in mind that the MI5 official history is not a always flattering one, the CIA history yeah, is Yeah, so that, that's, that's okay. I mean, you know, in our system, I can say that any history which is written will be filtered somewhere. So I don't think we need to worry about it. We should get somebody to write it. And then see that it's all right. And it's, it's, it's rumored that RAW has been asking officers since your last book to seek clearance before they publish even newspaper articles, let alone books. Was your book sub have, uh, subjected to censorship of this kind? Did you ask for permission? No, no, no. no. The, uh, as I said, I only asked for my wife's permission. And uh, <laughs> I haven't asked for any permission because the, there is no such rule as far as I am aware. Ah, you didn't. You didn't get any notification. No, or... there is no notification. There is no rule. I've never heard of it. And our officers continue to write. Uh, what's his name? Tilak Daveshar has written two or three books recently on one on, on Pashtun, Pashtun, which I, I was on soft cover. On, I comment uh, on, you to on the Pashtun on Pakistan. He's an authority on those subjects, and why not? Why should he not write? 
I, I think uh, Jaydev has written a book on China or something. Jaydev, yes. Yeah. Would you would you support? Uh, there's, there's been debate yesterday. The director of the National Archives uh, complaining, so to speak, about the reluctance of some ministries, particularly defence, uh, to open up. I I, I understand that defence has only submitted documents up till 1960, though they're, they're supposed to be only a 25 year gap. Would you support, uh, after an appropriate amount of time and vetting, that even the archives of the IB and RAW uh, be opened up to historians? Would that be a good thing in your view? I, I think that that review has to be undertaken by the agencies uh, themselves. But um, I do think that we are uh, unnecessarily sort of uh, over cautious in, in this respect, you know. Because uh, if uh, if all the other agencies worldwide can do it, what is our problem? It will help a great deal. But you know what happens here, I hmm. tell you, uh, you know, in our business, uh, we are very often blamed for security failures. We, obviously, there are failures. Otherwise, nothing would go wrong in the world. And 9-11 would not have happened. Hmm. And so, um, but uh, the good that, uh, uh, as I think Mark Antony said, that <laughs> the evil so let it be. Do, yes. uh, so let it be with Caesar. The good that the agencies do never gets known. You know? It's not in the public domain, so it's all right. It's fair enough, provided people understand it, and that is why it's important to have an official history written. So that people do understand uh, what has been happening, what is all the good that the agencies have done or the IB has done. Now, because the IB is over 100 years old now. I'm, I'm going to ask you a final question because, it, it, you know, your, your last chapter on Mr. Doval, which I, I really think people would enjoy reading, surprised me because you had generous and kind words to say about him despite your manifest differences over Kashmir and, and, and other policy no, issues. I think we've agreed much more than we disagreed. So, and my whole point in that last chapter is that we can differ, we can disagree, but we are still friends. Absolutely. But uh, one of the things that struck me was that a number of key episodes in, if you like, the public story uh, of Mr. Doval, which has, you know, not come from his mouth, but from yeah, various yeah, journalists yeah, yeah, and the, so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, yeah. That some elements of that even you were unaware of and history, this this is all things from a very long time ago. Uh, yeah, but, but there I, is no historical record. Is, yeah, but I would I should be unaware of, you know, because what he's doing is his business and what I'm doing is in well, our, our business. You, you, you and we only would, we only get to know on the need to know basis. You just said you would support declassification after a yeah, sensible yeah. amount of time. That, so we could that, that's right. But you know, if when, for instance, when Ajit was involved in the Punjab, I didn't know what was happening. All I knew was that there were four guys at it in the Punjab and they don't, didn't all see eye to eye. Because those differences would, would be mouthed here and there or come to the surface. But what they were doing operationally, I had no idea. And I, and I should not have had any idea. It's only now that one learns that um, Ajit Dole was involved in, in Black Thunder. Which again, there is debate and disputation about because we don't, you know, exactly what he did or didn't do. Well, we, we don't have an archive for or a yeah, but historical. If if, uh, uh, if, uh, if, the, if the narrative or the legend is coming from Ajit himself, I wouldn't disbelieve him. I, I, would, I would go along with him. If it is, which yeah. we don't know. But yeah. a final question, sir. Is there a danger when writing books from an intelligence, uh, by an intelligence officer about their service and careers? Um, that myth making or self projection can overtake reality. B. N. Malik's book, for example, B. N. Malik was a person who had enormous influence over the Prime Minister, with some would say tragic consequences, and a book that didn't quite fess up to some of mis uh, the mistakes. You is see, that, is you that, see that uh, it's not just intel the, the intelligence services. Why why pick on the intelligence services? That would be true of of any bureaucrat uh, writing right. a memoir, you know. But uh, Praveen, I can say, and I can say with some pride that I have neither tried to create a myth around myself, nor have I ever once. Now this is the third book. 
spoken ill of anybody. You haven't I, spoken I, ill of anybody. I, 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 actually... I am very careful. <laughs> I, in fact, uh, an IAS officer asked me after my first book. He says it's remarkable that you mentioned so many people in your book, but you've not said anything critical about anybody. I said, why should I say anything critical? I would not mention him. So if I mention a Doval, it is more to praise him. My sort of really last last question is that my one grievance with this book actually is that it doesn't tell us very much about what you have done in Kashmir. Are you planning ever to write a granular account? You've, you've written an earlier book on this subject, I know, but uh, in terms of operations, in terms of the characters, uh, uh, would you be considering one day doing a granular historical account? <laughs> maybe maybe I was uh, operationally incompetent. <laughs> 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 which which would still merit a book, but uh, would you be? Is this something I've given never, the importance never, that you revisit this? I, I've never thought of it because, as I say, I, I I would never like to cross that red line, in which uh, I would be saying anything or exposing anybody, or writing about anything which is not already in the public domain. I've tried to take advantage of things which are in the public domain, and then write them in my own way. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Mr. Dulla. Uh, if you haven't got a copy already, this is likely to be the most talked about book of 2022, at least as far as uh, things to do with the politics of the security community in Delhi go. Uh, I would really commend reading it though, not just because of the famous last chapter, uh, which is much talked about, but a lot of what comes before that last chapter. Uh, it's full of fantastic insights and all I can say again is I hope there will be a follow-up book on Kashmir because there's a lot of tantalizing and fascinating stuff that you no, haven't written Now you're about. talking like Farooq Abdullah who <laughs> always says this guy only gives you the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> 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 he's not wrong. He's not wrong. Let's leave it at the tip. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>